It's no surprise to most of you that the motorcycle industry today is dominated by several multinational companies, but it's safe to assume that none of them would be here today if not for the manufacturers that came and failed before them. The Excelsior Motor Company, OK Supreme, HRD Motorcycles and Vincent Motorcycles. These four manufacturers all walked so that brands like Yamaha, Kawasaki, Suzuki and Ducati could run. In today's episode of On Your Bike, the stories of four iconic motorcycle manufacturers whose operations have permanently ceased, yet whose legacies continue to be seen to this day. When it comes to the Excelsior Motor Company, many are rightfully confused about what really happened. After all, there was a time when there were three different Excelsior brands in the world, with every one of them operating in the same industry. In Germany, there was the Excelsior Fahrrad Motorradwerk, while in the United Kingdom, there was Excelsior Motorcycles, which stayed in business from 1896 all the way until 1964. Across the pond in the United States was Excelsior USA, which produced motorcycles from 1905 to 1931 and was later renamed to Excelsior Henderson. The British Excelsior wasn't always a manufacturer of motorcycles. Rather, they started out as a bicycle company called Bayless, Thomas & Co, producing penny farthings in the city of Coventry in the West Midlands region of England. In 1896, company executives decided to install Minerva engines on their bicycles, which effectively turned them into motorcycles. This proved to be a huge hit, and four years later, their machines were being entered in racing competitions, which officially made them one of the very first British manufacturers to do so. They officially renamed themselves Excelsior Motor Company in 1910, and their popularity continued throughout the following years. At the end of World War I, though, they were acquired by one of their major suppliers, R. Walker and Sons, who moved their entire production line to the city of Birmingham. It was here that the focus really shifted to producing motorcycles, releasing models like the B14, which won the lightweight TT race in 1929, as well as the Autobike and the Wellbike. The latter was a small collapsible motorcycle that became transportation of choice by the Allied paratroopers during World War II. However, the British Excelsior struggled to find an audience for their luxury motorcycles during the lean post-war years. They switched to making machines equipped with two-stroke engines, which were becoming increasingly favoured by the masses due to their durability and cheap price tags. They were never able to recover the market traction they once had, however, and in 1965, they were finally forced to fold, being bought out by Britax, a car accessory company. The American Excelsior reflected the sudden rise and fall of its British counterpart. Founded in 1876, they too began as a manufacturer of bicycles and bicycle parts. While business boomed during the end of the 19th century, thanks to the popularity of group rides and bike rallies, the company was able to anticipate the turn of the tide and began actively looking for ways to improve their machines. By 1905, they were already producing motorcycles operating out of Randolph Street in Chicago. To quote the New York Motorcyclopedia Museum, in 1905, Excelsior built its first motorcycle after over 30 years of experience in the business of manufacturing bicycles. It was this prior knowledge that gave them an advantage over the emerging motorcycle manufacturers of the time. The first Excelsior allowed riders to travel at speeds of up to 40 miles per hour. The company made a name for itself as one of the most innovative motorcycle manufacturers in America, and it wasn't long before their machines were mainstays in racing clubs and competitions across the country. Besides landing them several world records, this organic and word-of-mouth marketing strategy was extremely effective in getting the Excelsior brand of motorcycles out there. In 1911, the company even began paying racers to use their machines, allowing them to make design modifications, which were later implemented in the actual models. Because of this, Excelsior turned into a household name practically overnight and became one of the leading motorcycle manufacturers in the country. 
The following year, in 1912, the company was purchased for half a million dollars, or the equivalent of today, 13.7 million, by the Schwinn Bicycle Company. Thanks to their massive factories and established production lines, the price of Excelsior models were significantly reduced, making them even more accessible to the American public. The year 1912 also saw a man named William Henderson begin to produce motorcycles in Detroit, Michigan. He had spent nearly two decades in the automotive industry working for his father, who was the vice president of Winton Motors, the Ohio-based company that pioneered the country's automobile manufacturing industry. Later, Henderson's name would become synonymous with that of Excelsior's. At this point, Excelsior, under the Schwinn Bicycle Company, were neck and neck with Henderson, dominating the country's industry as the top motorcycle manufacturers. In 1915, Excelsior started production of the Big Valve X, which was a V-twin motorcycle equipped with a three-speed gearbox, largely considered to be the fastest motorcycle at that point in time. This, along with the company's other models, began to be used by police and military forces across the globe. By 1917, however, Henderson were suffering financial woes, mostly brought about by supply shortages and the effects of World War I. This eventually led them to selling their operations to Excelsior. Production of their existing models was transferred to facilities of the Schwinn Bicycle Company, but a mere three years later. William Henderson reneged on their contract and set up another motorcycle manufacturing plant with his business partner, Max Sladkin, creating the Ace Motorcycle Corporation. Sadly, William would tragically die in an accident in 1922 when the machine that he was test driving was hit side on by a car. However, the merger was a huge success and Excelsior Henderson became the first ever company in the United States to release a motorcycle that was capable of covering an entire mile in a minute. The speed of their machines, as well as its innovative engines, impressed the nation's law enforcement so much that over 600 different police forces across the country chose their brand over other popular motorcycle manufacturers such as Harley-Davidson and Indian Motorcycle. The combined forces of Excelsior and Henderson saw the company set a slew of world records. For instance, Wells Bennett rode one of their models, the Henderson Deluxe, from Canada all the way to Mexico in an unprecedented 42 hours and 24 minutes. On his way back, he added a sidecar and a passenger and broke yet another record, this time for the sidecar. The Super X was the very last model the Excelsior Henderson produced. Launched in 1925, it also won countless races and set many world records before being restyled as a modern cruiser in 1929. While this machine was widely successful, the company itself was forced to shut down on March 31st, 1931, a mere two years after the devastating Wall Street crash. Although the company had many orders from police forces and dealers alike, Igne Swin decided that the depression was going to get worse, and so he decided to quit while ahead, read one article. And thus, the reign of the leading motorcycle manufacturer in the United States, and arguably in the entire North American continent, ended. Founded in 1882 by Ernest Humphreys and Charles Dawes, OK Supreme also started its journey as a bicycle manufacturer, though at the time simply known as OK. By 1899, both Humphreys and Dawes had seen the writing on the wall and had begun to tinker around with engines and bicycles before finally releasing their company's very first motorcycle in 1911. This particular model was a two-stroke motorcycle equipped with a precision engine. This was entered in the 1912 Isle of Man Tourist Trophy races, which at the time was on its fifth run. While OK Supreme managed to snag ninth place in this competition, this failed to translate to success. The next few years saw modest returns on their motorcycles. That is, until the company began to use Jap engines in their machines. In 1926, Dawes expressed his desire to focus only on bicycles and left to start his own company, Dawes Cycles. Because of this, OK turned into a family business, with Humphrey's son John and his daughter Frida and Alice manning the helm alongside him. 
They then rebranded as OK Supreme. In 1928, Humphreys sought to expand their operation and purchased the failed motorcycle manufacturer HRD Motorcycles. After collecting their factory facilities and tools, he sold the rest of the company to a man named Philip Vincent, who would eventually use it to kickstart his own motorcycle manufacturing firm, Vincent Motorcycles. Armed with the swift and powerful Jap engines, the machines that OK Supreme produced started winning races across England. The company continued to expand and popularise the practice of naming their models. For instance, one of their motorcycles was christened the Lighthouse because of an inspection window that allowed the rider to check whether oil levels were nearing the camshaft. This particular model first appeared during the 1930 Isle of Man TT, where it infamously broke the lap record from a standing start. It was a huge hit and OK Supreme started producing a road-friendly version after the sporting event. Unfortunately, the Great Depression also put a halt to the company's operations. In 1933, they released the last lighthouse machine and by 1939, OK Supreme had drawn its final breath, never recovering from the floundering economy and the massive financial hit that they had suffered. The company remained listed until the end of 1940 and was said to have contributed greatly to the Allied effort during the Second World War. Much like OK Supreme HRD motorcycles, the company that Ernie Humphreys had purchased also shut down due to financial constraints. Founded by a fighter pilot named Howard Raymond Davies, in 1924 the British motorcycle manufacturer began producing their first machine, a luxury sporting model targeted towards the wealthy. The following year Davies entered the Isle of Man TT and used his company's own models, where he emerged victorious in the senior event. His win led to a flood of orders, but this failed to translate into profits that were sufficient enough to sustain their operations. HRD Motorcycles was bogged down by the small size of their premises, which limited their operation capabilities. They did expand their facilities, but this proved to be too costly of an endeavour. The company's constant victories at the Isle of Man TT races throughout the following years increased demand for their machines. However, their production lines always failed to meet it. In 1926, workers at HRD Motorcycles went on strike, which damaged their operations even more. By January 1928, the company was done for. Their financial situation had worsened and Davies was forced to voluntarily liquidate the eponymous HRD Motorcycles. The operations were bought by Ernest Humphreys, the founder of OK Supreme. Humphreys had kept the company's tools and production facilities, but sold everything else to Philip Vincent on May 1928 for a grand total of £450, or the equivalent of approximately £28,400 sterling today. Equipped with the tooling and machine patterns of HRD motorcycles, Vincent launched the manufacturing company Vincent Motorcycles later that same year. It may have been built on the ashes of a failed motorcycle manufacturer, but Vincent Motorcycles wasn't anything like its predecessor. Today, the company is revered as one of the companies that pioneered classic British motorcycles, paving the way for iconic brands like Norton or Triumph. According to Tim Kirker, the president of the Vincent Owners Club, in my view, the Vincent really was the first successful British motorcycle. They were definitely the best tourer. The technology and power had not been seen before, but as a company, they really were tiny. They only made around 11,000 bikes in a short history. For comparison, Hinkley, the home of Triumph, were turning out 30,000 bonnies every year. Philip Vincent came from wealth. His family owned a successful cattle ranch in Argentina and were happy to provide funding for whatever business venture he desired. He was a motorcycle enthusiast, building his own machine in 1927 and registering a patent in 1928 for a cantilever rear suspension that he had personally designed. While Vincent desired to start his own motorcycle manufacturing company, 
he wanted to do so under an already established name. Fortunately, the stars were all lined up for him and he was able to purchase HRD motorcycles from the head of OK Supreme, Ernest Humphreys. The company was swiftly renamed to Vincent HRD Company Limited and production was moved to Stevenage. In late 1931, an Australian engineer named Phil Irving joined the team along with E.J. Massey, who had worked at the original HRD motorcycles firm. To quote Tim Kirker, the first bikes were pretty crude, agricultural you could say, and plenty still do. Back then, materials were scarce and I guess the guys would trade whatever they could find. A bit of mild steel here for something more exotic there. In 1934, Vincent entered three of his machines in the Isle of Man TT races. However, this proved to be a catastrophe for the company. All three motorcycles experienced debilitating engine problems and failed to finish. A humiliating defeat for the fledgling Vincent HRD company. Infuriated, both Vincent and Irving decided to stop relying on market-ready engines and began experimenting with their own designs. They managed to come up with an engine that was so powerful and so reliable that it drew the attention of manufacturers from both England and the United States. But the two brilliant engineers weren't satisfied with the standards they had set and continued to tinker around with the design. Finally, Irving came up with the engine that would eventually turn them into icons of the British motorcycle manufacturing industry, the 1000cc V-Twin. According to the British Motorcyclists Federation website, as legend has it, Irving was sat at his drawing board with two sketches of their successful 500cc OHV engine side by side. He is said to have laid one over the other, lined up the center lines of the crankshaft and seen the future. A thousand cc V-twin. This monster of an engine would eventually earn Vincent Motorcycles its well-deserved place in history. It didn't take long for demand to skyrocket and in 1944, Vincent Motorcycles decided to expand their operations abroad. Recognizing the massive market of the United States, they opened a dealership in Philadelphia which was headed by a man named Eugene Orcott. Soon, others popped up across the country. Given their success stateside, Vincent decided to drop the initials HRD from the company's brand in a bid to avoid confusion with the American manufacturer Harley Davidson. With this, the machines they produced officially became known as just the Vincent. In 1948, Vincent Motorcycles launched the Black Shadow and the Black Lightning both of which were arguably the company's most well-known machines. The former was capable of reaching speeds of 125 miles an hour, while the latter was its more lightweight racing version. The Black Lightning machine rose to fame when the American racer, Rolly Free, used it to break the country's motorcycle land speed record on September 13, 1948, on the Bonneville Salt Flat in Utah. A photo of Free taken on this day, which showed him in a bathing suit and laid out like Superman across the Vincent Black Lightning, is widely regarded as the most famous picture in motorcycling history. According to Tim Kirker, everyone has seen the picture. Rolly Free on the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah, stretched out on the swimming trunks at over 150 miles per hour. The picture is instantly recognizable, and the bike is a Vincent. With Free's legendary bikini bike photo, along with the record-breaking speed that the Black Lightning had reached, Vincent Motorcycles became officially known as the manufacturer of the fastest motorcycles in the world. The company started producing more models. However, these were exorbitantly priced, especially when compared to other machines that were available in the market at the time. For buyers with lots of cash, there's the Vincent HRD, most expensive bike on view, costing near £600. This wasn't the only factor that contributed to the downfall of Vincent motorcycles. Tim Kirker said it was not just the finances and the sales slump. The trouble was that Vincent bikes were pretty bomb-proof. You had to do something pretty catastrophic to write one off, and they were reliable too. Basically, if you bought one, you never needed to buy another. 
In creating durable and foolproof machines, Vincent Motorcycles managed to eliminate their customers' demand for more. To his credit, Vincent did his best to sustain his struggling company. He attempted to land contracts with the Ministry of Defence and even tried his hand at importing scooters. All these endeavours unfortunately failed and a week before Christmas in 1955, Vincent Motorcycles produced its final machine. The Vincent HRD Owners Club, currently led by Tim Kirker, was originally established by Vincent himself. Today, the organisation aims to keep Vincent Motorcycles alive in the hearts and minds of enthusiasts across the globe, doing everything they can to keep the company's remaining bikes running. All four of them may have permanently closed their doors, but their legacies, as well as the massive impact they had on the industry, remain. Right guys, well there you have a nice little trek through history. Let me start by saying uh, we apologise for dropping our episodic output, but we have been stockpiling our episodes so that going forward we have a more regular output for you. And if you enjoyed this format of a little troll through history, why don't you check out our new channel, Well I Never, by clicking the link here. Right then. I know you've been missing it, but you've been told on your bike, 